Hi, this is Margaret Maloney, and welcome to the Death Dhamma Podcast. Together, we will consider life, death, and impermanence. Because in between birth and death, we lose things, not just our glasses and our keys. We lose identities, relationships, ideas, and more. But what we can gain right now is facing this together, and we will gain freedom, peace, and progress on our path. Hello there, and here we are, back on the Death Dhamma podcast. Today, we're going to talk about mindfulness of death, specifically coming from the Mara Nasate Sutta. It's in Anganakara 6.19. The Buddha calls his monks together and says to them, Mindfulness of death, when developed and pursued, is of great fruit and great benefit. It gains a footing in the deathless, has the deathless as its final end. Therefore, you should develop mindfulness of death. Well, that's actually good news, right? We are working on that together, and I appreciate you being with me as this journey of making friends with death continues. And even though season two, we've been really focusing on different aspects of impermanence, my ulterior motive, gosh, I don't even know if that's fair to say ulterior motive because I don't think it's a hidden motive, right? But my thought is that when we can embrace and learn to live with impermanence in all the different aspects of our lives, in all the different shapes and forms, then we can prepare ourselves for mindfulness of death. We can be living mindfully with death, developing mindfulness of death. That's really what this journey is about. Next, some of the monks speak up and describe the various ways in which they are practicing mindfulness of death. One is contemplating that he might just live for a night and a day. Another, that he might live for just a day. Another, for the duration of his meal. One, to at least chew four morsels of food. And still one more, thinking that it's to last just long enough to chew a single bite. Yet, A different monk expresses his mindfulness of death as contemplating just one breath. I can kind of relate to all those different ideas. I don't know how you feel about this, but I'll say things to my friends and I'm trying to say it in like a jovial manner. I'll be here till I'm not, right? Which is a reminder of I'm here now. I don't know when I won't be here anymore, but I'll be here till I'm not. But then sometimes in more specific discussions, I'll say, well, probably I won't die today or it's, you know, when I die, but that's probably not going to be today. Now, there I'm getting off course. I'm getting off course because I don't know whether it's today or not. Just because that moment, I think it's not today. That just means I have, you know, expectations expectations. And we know that expectations can lead to clinging and resistance to impermanence. So the Buddha, after listening to the replies from his monks, instructs all of them, whoever develops mindfulness of death thinking, oh, that I might live for a day and night, for a day, for the interval that it takes to eat a meal, for the interval that it takes to swallow having chewed up four morsels of food, that I might attend to the Blessed One's instructions, I would have accomplished a great deal. They are said to dwell heedlessly. They develop mindfulness of death, slowly, for the sake of ending the effluence. So, I'm not there yet if I'm saying I'm probably not going to die today. And I'm not there yet, and this is the slower group. Notice he said heedlessly. Oops. I have work to do. But whoever develops mindfulness of death, thinking, oh, that I might live for the interval that it takes to swallow having chewed up one morsel of food, for the interval that it takes to breathe out after breathing in, or to breathe in after breathing out, that I might attend to the Blessed One's instructions, I would have accomplished a great deal. They are said to dwell heedfully. They develop mindfulness of death acutely 
for the sake of ending the affluence. So this entire discussion takes place between the Buddha and his monks, despite my interjections, right? My post thousands of years, post a couple of thousands of years commentary. Many important teachings from the Pali Canon take place between the Buddha and his monks. And so anyway, this sutta, this section of the sutta is showing me that as much as I am, you know, sharing about the death dhamma and awareness of death and making friends with the Grim Reaper and all the different ways that I say it, in my practice, I could make many improvements, of course, and one of them being maybe not even to say like, it's probably not going to be today. I'm also not saying that I should walk around assuming I'm going to die today. However, there is that practice of when you think I could die today, it helps make a shift. And that is a beneficial shift. And as I'm saying this to you, I'm reminded of the value of that practice of thinking this could be my last day. And then really narrowing it down, right? This could be my last minute. This could be my last bite of food. And if I were really doing that, because I can't promise you I'm always doing that, I know that I'm not always doing that, but look at the focus. Talk about really setting your priorities. Now, about this sutta. So this entire discussion takes place between the Buddha and his monks. Many important teachings from the Pali Canon take place between the Buddha and his monks. And this has led more than one person to ask, are these teachings relevant to lay people? There are definitely times when the Buddha was teaching specifically to his monastics, right? The Vinaya is a good example. He's telling them, these are the rules for you to follow as monks. And there are times, there are teachings that he gave to lay, to lay people. And there are teachings that he gave to lay people. The Siglavada Sutta is one of the most common examples of a discourse that is specifically meant to help lay people. When the Buddha taught and only his monks were present, does that mean that we, when I'm saying we, I'm meaning those of us who are not monastics, not a monk, not a nun, does it mean we should not be concerned with the teachings? Let's think about that. If these teachings were only for the monastic community, why then did his monastics travel and share the teachings that they had committed to memory? Were they thinking that they were going to convert every person they came in contact with and everyone was going to put down the ways of the world and become a monk or a nun? I don't know, but I think that maybe they didn't have that despite the fact that there are teachings that, you know, show that being a monk or a nun does make it more likely for someone to be able to follow the path. But we all start somewhere. All of the collaboration and agreement that came from the early councils if these lessons were not meant to be shared, it seems that there would have been stricter controls around keeping the teachings secret, right? Or definitely segregating monastic teachings from teachings for the laity. The Buddha taught suffering and the liberation from suffering. We are all going to die. We will all benefit from having a peaceful death. We are all going to die. We will all benefit from having a peaceful death. And to be born into the human realm is a rare gift, not to be squandered. And to me, this means that, yes, we can all access the teachings. We can all access the teachings of Marana Sate and other suttas. If you find it overwhelming to contemplate that you might die in the midst of your meal, start small. You don't have to immediately go right to, I'm going to die. Some of you might, though. You might already be there. Many of us can benefit from truly reflecting upon the truth that there is suffering and the source of that suffering. Start by considering the Four Noble Truths. We suffer, and the source of that suffering is known, wanting things, people, and outcomes, or aversion to certain things or people or outcomes. Now consider impermanence. Things are always changing. And the more we hang on to perceptions of how things must be, the more difficult our lives become. You can start by looking at your plans for the day. 
Sometimes things go exactly as you imagined. And other times the entire day is a disaster. Or is it? When our plans fall apart, we are presented with an opportunity to embrace impermanence. Those broken plans are a representation of death. Something you relied upon goes away. An assumption becomes invalid. A cherished thing breaks. A relationship ends. Pay attention to your emotions as you watch your plans die. Pay attention to your emotions as you begin to watch your plans die with acceptance. As you begin to become comfortable with how uncertainty is always part of your daily life, you can begin to project beyond your daily plans. The plans you have made for your week, your month, your year, all of this is built on a perception of control and an illusion of certainty, right? Like that illusion when I say, yes, I'm going to die, but it's probably not today. Yet plans help us navigate our lives. So keep making plans. And as you do, acknowledge that there will be impermanence. Some of your plans or elements of your plans are going to die. And when this happens, call it death. Remind yourself that this is a type of death. Now you are living with death. As soon as you can, move from the death of things and ideas to the recognition that you and your loved ones are also subject to impermanence. Allow yourself to entertain the thought, one day I will die, or today could be my last day. Not, oh, I'm going to die, but it's probably not today. See, I'm reminding myself again. Bring these thoughts to your meditations and notice how it feels. Be aware of the emotions that arise and work to study those emotions. Try to be non-judgmental. You think what you think. You feel what you feel. Just be with it. Consider reading and chanting the five recollections each day. As you spend time following impermanence all the way through a natural progression from plans that died to your end of your life or the death of your loved ones, eventually you will develop more ease. And as a reminder, the five recollections. One, I am of the nature to grow old. I am not exempt from aging. Two, I am the nature to become diseased. I am not exempt from disease. Three, I am of the nature to die. I am not exempt from death. Four, all that is mine, dear and delightful, will change and vanish. Five, I am the owner of my karma. I'm born of my karma. I live supported by my karma. I will inherit my karma. Whatever I do, whether good or evil, that I will inherit. And you can find those in Anga Nakara Nikaya 5.57. Now, now you're ready to consider that you might chew one more bite. But you also might not chew one more bite. You've been listening to the Death Dhamma Podcast with your host, Margaret Maloney. Thank you so much for being here. Come find me on margaretmaloney.com. M-A-R-G-A-R-E-T-M-E-L-O-N-I dot com. And until we meet again, may you be well, may you be happy, may you be at ease, and may you be free from suffering. Bye for now.